Okay, can you hear me? Sounds good. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to use uh, largely Blackboard, but, uh, but some, uh, some PowerPoint slides. I'll start you off with a little bit of uh, eye candy of uh, fly through the uh, large scale structure of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this is using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey's three dimensional map of the distribution of galaxies and then the actual images of those galaxies uh, from, uh, from the Sloan survey, but blown up by about a factor of 100 uh, so that you can see them. I thought some about what I should uh, take as my title for, uh, for these lectures. Uh, and in the end, I settled on uh, precision cosmology with large-scale structure. I think that's what I said, I'll settled on, yes. Um, and uh, so I'll be talking about uh, clustering of galaxies, uh, the Lyman Alpha Forest, uh, a little bit about the cosmic microwave background, um, but particularly with a view to uh, applications to high precision cosmological measurements of the parameters of the universe and trying to test uh, ideas about, uh, about fundamental cosmology uh, with rather less emphasis on, uh, on aspects of, of galaxy formation physics, though galaxy formation will necessarily come in uh, when we're talking about using galaxies uh, as tracers of structure. And so broadly speaking in this field, uh, I think of uh, there being two, uh, two general classes of questions. Uh, so uh, fundamental questions about the matter uh, and energy contents of the universe. and about the initial conditions that seeded anisotropy in the microwave background and the formation of structure, uh, and astrophysical questions about uh, particularly the physics of galaxy formation and the intergalactic medium, IGM, um, and clusters of galaxies and so forth. Yes? Uh, it's a good, fair question. Um, and I think uh, I will mostly mean um, the regime characterized by linear theory. By linear perturbation theory for the growth of fluctuations. So uh, for the most part, I will assume that these are coming out of inflation or something like inflation. Um, and I won't uh, attempt to address why inflation occurred um, or what, uh, or alternatives to inflation and so forth. So Justin Corey is going to uh, address that topic in his lectures. Uh, and from my point of view, I'm going to, uh, I'd say we're going to use large scale structure to try to tell us about what came out of that phase. So great question. Um, and uh, I'm about equally interested in, uh, in both of these classes of questions. And I worked on both of them uh, through my career. Uh, but for the most part, these lectures will focus uh, on this second category. Uh, sorry, on the first category. And they used to be very closely intertwined. Uh, and that's because you know, large-scale galaxy clustering used to be the main thing 
that we had available to actually try to address uh, these fundamental questions before any anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background had been detected. Uh, and in trying to understand the physics of galaxy formation, we had very open questions about uh, the nature of dark matter, about uh, what the initial conditions might be like, about how much dark matter uh, there was in the universe. Uh, and so we were really trying to go both directions on a, on a two-way street uh, to simultaneously figure out the underlying cosmology um, and to uh, understand the, the physics of galaxy formation that translated that cosmology into our main observables. They are considerably more decoupled now than they used to be because we now understand, uh, we know enough about the cosmological model that the remaining uncertainties, for the most part, aren't uncertainties in how galaxies form. There are some, uh, there's still some dependence of galaxy formation physics on things we don't know about the cosmological model, but mostly we've now pinned down what we need to know for purposes of modeling galaxy formation. That doesn't mean we understand everything about galaxy formation, but most of our uh, open questions here have to do with things like star formation and cooling and feedback, uh, and not with what the initial conditions were like. Um, and uh, on the other side, we now have many different routes uh, to testing uh, cosmological models that I will come to uh, over the course of, of this lecture. So a uh, bit of uh, historical introduction. So you know, when you, you talk about, uh, when you give talks and lectures like these, uh, you think, well, think back to when you, know, you were a graduate student or a postdoc and say the first event like this that I attended was a, a summer school on galaxy formation uh, in Eriche in, I think, 1987. So it was my second year of, of graduate school just as, uh, as I was uh, starting starting my PhD thesis. Uh, and also when I was in graduate school, uh, I, my wife and I made this uh, board game called Galaxy Formation. And the, uh, so my wife did uh, all of the artwork, uh, including uh, you had the option of playing various famous um, uh, cosmologists. And, uh, the, um, and I wrote the very complicated rules. Uh, and this was not a game that was really designed to actually be played, um, although it was attempted a, a, few, different, uh, a few different times. And uh, so, so in this game, you would play a theory of galaxy formation, and the goal of the game was to have uh, everyone else in the game agree that your theory of galaxy formation was the true and correct one. Um, and so, you know, you did this by going and writing papers in these various different areas. You had to roll the dice to get your paper refereed. Uh, you had to, to spin uh, the spinner to get, uh, to get funding to carry out your research. And now that I've done that enough, I realize that I gave far too small odds to getting no funding, um, which happens a lot more. The, uh, uh, you could spin for the Hubble constant, and the values of the Hubble constant that were allowed were anywhere between 30 uh, and 100, which was sort of the range of debate in the late 1980s. Um, and there were observational developments that could come out one way or another. Cosmic microwave backgrounds uh, fluctuations were discovered or not discovered, uh, or cosmic strings were discovered or not discovered. And these would affect uh, the plausibility of, uh, of various different theories. Now, from uh, the point of view of actually uh, learning anything, what's, uh, what's interesting about this game is to look back at, at uh, what you could what you could play at the playing pieces. Because I said you could be a person, but really you're trying to, uh, to win your, your theory. Um, and so the options in the middle, uh, lower right, we had cold dark matter. Um, to the left, we had massive neutrinos. Uh, so this I, I, this, I think, was 1987 uh, when we made this. Um, so uh, hot dark matter, in which the, the dominant form of dark matter was neutrinos. Uh, Jim Peebles uh, was, uh, at the time, uh, still uh, advocating fairly strongly a, a model in which there were only baryonic uh, dark matter, no, uh, no non-baryonic dark matter. Um, 
And uh, then cosmic strings uh, were still quite popular, so you could play uh, cosmic strings over here, or superconducting cosmic strings, which would uh, uh, basically blow, uh, blow bubbles, electromagnetic bubbles that would press stuff off, so that's superconducting cosmic strings up there. Uh, explosions, in which uh, the supernova explosions from the early generations of galaxies would, uh, would create expanding bubbles uh, on which uh, further galaxies formed. Um, and, uh, and any of these were, uh, were topics, thank you, um, that you could, uh, yeah, basically anything here, these were things that, that you know, were in polite discussion and you could get uh, papers published on in the Astrophysical Journal and so forth. Um, this is primordial magnetic fields, which you know, never really was a fully developed theory of galaxy formation, but which people uh, nonetheless talked about uh, all the time. And you could also play the skeptic, which meant you couldn't actually win the game, but you could go try and take away points uh, from everybody else. And uh, so what's interesting is to, uh, is to realize how completely uh, things have, have collapsed. Right? And now we really just talk about variance on this. Uh, and we no longer really even talk about competing theories of galaxy formation. Uh, we talk about... Uh, the parameters of the cosmological model. Uh, and, the, um, and so uh, beginning particularly, I think, with the, discover with the first detections of microwave background fluctuations uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the discussion really collapsed around variants of this model, uh, and all these other ones basically went away. Um, so a somewhat more serious version of the same point uh, is, to, uh, is to go to, uh, I dug this out of a drawer of, uh, of my uh, overhead transparencies. So, uh, you know, back in the day when we give talks with overhead transparencies. Um, and I would usually uh, begin, with, uh, begin my talks with stating the big questions of the field I was working in. Um, and, uh, and those big questions... Uh, I had you know, variations uh, of this phrasing, but uh, is the gravitational instability picture basically correct? Did structure form by gravitational growth of small primordial fluctuations? Uh, if so, what were the properties of those primordial fluctuations? Uh, and where did they come from? Uh, so inflation was around as a hypothesis for, uh, for where they came from, made quantitative predictions, and we wanted to test uh, those predictions. What is the dark matter? So at that point, it was very much uh, open whether dark matter was uh, massive neutrinos, was uh, uh, some uh, other kind of exotic particle, or was baryonic matter that had been packaged into non-luminous form, uh, black holes, white dwarfs, uh, or uh, Jupiters. Uh, and what is omega? And uh, at the time, at least, you could just write omega without, uh, without subscripts. And the... Um, uh, so when I wrote this, uh, I'm sure I was thinking of omega as being representing the density of matter uh, in the universe and didn't re wasn't really thinking about uh, that possibly being different from the total energy density. And then the questions below the line, that's the one where my phrasing changed a lot depending on what, uh, what I was actually uh, attempting to, uh, what, what the focus of my talk was. But... Uh, so sometimes that would be uh, questions about how do galaxies form, what determines the luminosities and masses and sizes and morphologies of galaxies. Uh, but from the point of view of constraining cosmology with large-scale structure, uh, the big question is what's the relation between the distribution of galaxies and the underlying distribution of mass? And particularly important at, uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, was the question of when you look at typical galaxies, things with luminosities similar to the Milky Way, is their clustering similar to the clustering of underlying dark matter? Uh, in which case, the density of matter that you infer from, uh, from the clustering of galaxies should be similar to the total density of mass in the universe? Or are the kind of typical galaxies strongly biased 
uh, more clustered than the dark matter by a factor of, uh, of two or so, in which case you could have a critical density of dark matter uh, and galaxies just tracing the highest density regions. So this was largely a question about galaxy bias. And what's striking to, to look back uh, at these questions is they are basically answered. Um, or at least we have uh, answers that are, uh, we've greatly narrowed down the range uh, of possible answers. So one answer is yes. Right? We really know structure formed by gravitational instability. Uh, and we know that the properties of primordial fluctuations uh, are very close to the predictions of simple inflation models, uh, Gaussian nearly scale invariant adiabatic. I'll have more to say about that uh, later on. Um, we still don't know what dark matter is, but we're virtually certain it's not baryonic uh, and that it's a, a weakly interacting uh, particle and that it, uh, it is cold or pretty cold. Um, and the, question, the answer to the question about omega turned out to be the most interesting of all. Uh, that, uh, you know, I would say when I would give this talk in the late 80s, the question was, is omega 0.2 or is omega 1? Uh, and, you know, the answer turns out to be both. That the, the matter density is uh, about three-tenths of the critical density, but there is an additional energy component uh, that makes uh, the total energy density of the universe uh, approximately critical. And the relation between distribution of galaxies, we now know that uh, typical galaxies, uh, like, uh, like the Milky Way, are in an RMS sense about as strongly clustered as dark matter but more luminous uh, or redder galaxies uh, are more strongly clustered. Uh, and there's lots of details to this last question, which will be uh, a focus of my second lecture. Um, and this is uh, the kind of, the principal sort of data that we were using in the 1980s uh, were maps of the distribution of galaxies. Uh, the lower left from, uh, was one slice from the first uh, CFA Redshift survey, which uh, totaled about uh, 3,000 galaxies. Uh, and this, uh, this big picture in the middle, which is still kind of iconic, uh, though becoming uh, less so. But this appeared my first year of graduate school. Um, and this kind of visual impression of uh, structure over scales of, of hundreds of, mega, of many tens of megaparsecs uh, had a big uh, impression on people and was playing a big role in these discussions about structure formation. So if I, uh, it's right here. if I were to write my list of cosmological questions today, um, and again, focusing on this, uh, this fundamental category, I would pick uh, Y is the universe accelerating? Still, what is dark matter? We know a lot about what it isn't, but we still do not know what it is. We know that neutrinos have uh, non-zero mass, and cosmology is perhaps the best tool we have for figuring out what their masses are. Um, and, the, uh, and more generally, we could ask about other properties of neutrinos. How many neutrino species are there? Um, and uh, are there uh, sterile neutrino species that contribute to the energy density of the universe uh, but don't show up in most of our particle physics experiments? And then on this question of initial conditions, uh, I'll phrase this uh, in two sort of different ways. Um, what are the departures of the initial conditions from uh, scale invariant 
Gaussian adiabatic scalar. And by scalar, I mean fluctuations just in the density. So departures would mean gravity waves, uh, tensor fluctuations. And we've detected that there are departures from scale invariance. Um, everything seems consistent so far with fluctuations that are Gaussian, adiabatic, and scalar. Um, so, uh, so we're now interested in the small departures uh, from the most generic predictions. And another way to phrase this question would be to focus more. This is sort of observational, uh, but the underlying physics uh, we're interested in is you know, what is the physics of inflation or is inflation correct at all? Is that really where these primordial fluctuations come from? Um, and uh, so this is, I think, how I, I think of the, the main questions we're after today. Uh, and alternatively, uh, you can phrase what you're doing in terms of questions you want to answer, or you can phrase it in terms of, well, I've got a standard model, uh, and I'm just going to try to break it. I'm going to measure things with, uh, with increasing precision uh, and see if something breaks down and hope that if something breaks, that that teaches me uh, some new physics. So I'll go on and say more about that, that standard cosmological model. Um, let me just pause for a moment. Uh, in case people want to ask questions so far. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, what, what was the discussion of the cosmological constant in the, in the 1980s uh, and early 90s? And there was a fair amount of, of, uh, of discussion of it, um, and particularly uh, uh, so obviously it was a possibility, you know, it had been around as a possibility ever since uh, Einstein 1917. Uh, and it was, it was still, I, I would say the, the main reason that people were interested in it was to reconcile the inflationary prediction of omega equal to one with observational evidence for uh, a low matter density. Uh, nonetheless, I think that, that if you, uh, for the most part, when people thought about a low density universe, one with a matter density that was 0.2 or 0.3 uh, of the critical density, people would typically think of that as corresponding to an open universe uh, with curvature, but then say, you know, or alternatively, there could be a cosmological constant and it could be flat. Um, and then, some people would say, you know, that, that, the, cos that the cosmological constant was, was the better, uh, you know, that was their, their preferred choice uh, in that alternative. So both of those things were, were under discussion. And certainly by the time you got to the, the uh, if you were writing papers on, in this subject in the 19, early 1990s, uh, you would typically, you would often have uh, uh, SCDM, OCDM, LCDM, TCDM, tau CDM. These were all variations on cold dark matter. S meant standard and usually referred to omega matter equal to one. OCDM was open uh, with a low matter density in an open universe. LCDM was with a cosmological constant. Uh, and then there were uh, other, other variants uh, in which you played around with the initial power spectrum or something else. Uh, and part of the reason that the supernova evidence for the, so particularly once we had the cosmic microwave background fluctuations uh, and you started to be able to compare the amplitude of fluctuations in the early universe to what we saw today, that's when I think uh, the, the notion of a cosmological constant was taken much more seriously uh, because it was clear that if you put that in, then a lot of things fit better. Uh, and so at that point, the decision uh, you know, it was kind of clear that LCDM was the empirically preferred model. And the question was just, well, how outlandish did you think it was?
to have a cosmological constant. But this is the reason that the supernova evidence for acceleration was accepted so quickly by the community, uh, was partly that there were two different groups that had found the same answer, uh, despite being in competition. Uh, and so that kind of ruled out a lot of the, uh, the easiest ways to have screwed things up. Um, but mostly, you know, there was already a lot of evidence that, that this was actually the model that best fit uh, observations of large-scale structure and the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and once you had really direct evidence for acceleration, then instead of thinking, oh, well, this is a, a, a ridiculous thing to put into a cosmological model, uh, everybody sort of thought, oh, I guess that's why this is the best fit, because it's actually there. So that would be my take on the history. I don't know, Ravi, you lived through a lot of the same stuff. Do you basically agree? Yeah. Um, OK, uh, so let's talk about this uh, standard cosmological model. Usually abbreviated. Lambda CDM for cold dark matter with a cosmological constant. Yes? So you would suggest that the So, good question. So I would, under here, you know, I did not write this question, what is dark energy? And the reason I didn't write it as what is dark energy is I think that the answer to why the universe is accelerating could quite well be because of, uh, uh, alternatives to, to uh, because of modifications of gravity. Um, and so, uh, so really, I think, as soon as you break this question down, you break it into, is the universe accelerating because GR is incorrect, or is it accelerating because of dark energy within GR? Now, you could also ask, all right, can you explain the observational, uh, the observations that imply dark matter with alternative gravity? Uh, and you know, people still do investigate that. Uh, my view at this point is that the evidence that the phenomenology of dark matter really is because of dark matter rather than modified gravity is very strong. So I no longer, I used to pay a lot of attention to that question, I no longer do. But when we come to acceleration, I think it could very well be uh, whether, uh, it, it could very well be alternatives. And you'll hear from that. You'll hear more on that from people who know the subject better than me. Good question. Uh, so, right, so this means cold dark matter with uh, a cosmological constant. And although it's not written into the title here, it really means with uh, inflationary initial conditions, or at least initial conditions that have the same kinds of properties that inflation predicts. Uh, and so in uh, vanilla uh, lambda CDM, the assumptions are um, nearly scale invariant. Gaussian adiabatic primordial fluctuations. And uh, so by nearly scale invariant, we mean that, uh, call this P primordial, uh, is uh, approximately a power law, some amplitude times k to the ns, and that ns, uh, the scalar spectral index, is approximately equal to 1, so that we have equal fluctuations in the gravitational potential uh, as a function of scale. Um, and adiabatic means the fluctuations are equally present in matter and radiation in the early universe. Uh, dark matter uh, is uh, weakly interacting. It could be just gravitationally interacting. Uh, really, we mean it has weak interactions 
with itself. It, it has no, no electromagnetic or strong uh, interactions with itself or with uh, baryons. And uh, that it is too cold to affect galaxy formation. So that could be because the particles are massive and they're formed in the early universe with low thermal velocities, uh, or they're actually formed with low velocities because they arise uh, from some physics that doesn't put them in thermal equilibrium. Uh, and from a cosmologist's point of view, you know, cold means that, uh, that it didn't affect uh, the formation of even the smallest galaxies. Um, right. Uh, dark energy that is constant in space and time. So that's the lambda. Um, and a flat universe, hence uh, omega total equal 1. And then we can discuss a variety of uh, alternatives to that. Take this off. So there are a number of parameters to this model. Um, and uh, if we take this, uh, th this simplest form, then the, uh, there are various ways to, uh, to, to bookkeep those parameters. But one way, a sort of uh, cosmic microwave background oriented list of those parameters would be omega CH squared. So uh, C standing for the cold dark matter here, H being the Hubble constant divided by 100. Um, so this is uh, the physical density of dark matter. Uh, this being uh, the physical density of baryons. Uh, omega lambda would be uh, the energy density of dark energy. Uh, something is written in various ways, uh, but I'll write as AS uh, is the amplitude of the primordial uh, density fluctuations. Uh, and really, I mean the, the amplitude of the power spectrum of those fluctuations. So it's that thing there. Uh, let's see. Do we start, does this start to get blocked if I write down here, or can everybody see down here? It's good? OK. Uh, you're the most likely to be blocked, so I'll write lower. Um, so NS would be the index of the primordial power spectrum. And uh, then the last one is, uh, is a little bit different uh, in character from these. Uh, it's the optical depth. Uh, of um, for scattering of CMB photons. Uh, after reionization. Mm -hmm. 
So it's different in that you know, this one is, not, this is really an, an astrophysical nuisance parameter. Um, it's a physically interesting one. We're interested in knowing about when the universe reionized and uh, over, what, uh, over what epoch. Um, but it's not sort of something characterizing the matter uh, density of the universe uh, or the initial conditions. But uh, we need it because when we consider the amplitude of uh, the cosmic microwave background power spectrum here, then what that's uh, actually proportional to is, uh, so the CMB power spectrum is proportional to uh, this amplitude uh, of the actual matter fluctuations times e to the minus 2 tau because uh, when those, uh, if, the, the CMB and I, if the CMB photons are scattered at late times, that washes out the fluctuations by a factor of e to the minus tau, and then uh, the power spectrum goes like the square, uh, so we get e to the minus 2 tau. Um, so if we're going to use microwave background fluctuations, then we have to consider this uh, as a parameter. And uh, at low redshift, take this. When we're talking about the amplitude of fluctuations, uh, we often refer not to AS, but to uh, sigma 8 which is the RMS matter fluctuation amplitude in eight megaparsec spheres as computed by, by linear theory. Um, and the eight megaparsecs is uh, sort of historical, but it's there because this is roughly the scale on which the amplitude of matter fluctuations uh, is about one uh, today. So, uh, so sometimes I'll talk about uh, amplitude of, when we're talking about the cosmic microwave background, AS will mostly be, uh, I'll mostly use AS, but later on when we're talking about uh, the uh, large scale structure, we'll frequently refer to sigma eight. So questions, yeah. Between tau and so there's there's uh, there's relations in the sense of um, the uh, of they both affect what you observe. There's also, I mean, there's relations in the sense of if you change the initial conditions, you'll change when galaxies form. Uh, and you'll change when reionization occurs. But in terms of, um, I think that, uh, and maybe what you're getting at uh, is that the, uh, so really my statement that the uh, fluctuations are suppressed by e to the minus 2 tau, that's true over most scales. That's true over sort of all of these scales. And out at these largest scales, uh, things are not suppressed. Uh, because the, the scale of the fluctuations is large compared to the size of the horizon at reionization. And so there is also some influence uh, of tau on NS, because basically this NS you're trying to get by sort of comparing the overall tilt here, uh, comparing these fluctuations to these fluctuations, taking into account all of the astrophysics that's causing these oscillations and so forth. And so the principal effect of tau is that it moves this whole thing up and down. But then a secondary effect is that, that it moves this stuff up and down a little bit relative to that. Um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, Yes. Do you know that NS is constant in space and time? Uh, in space and time. Uh, that's, that's what? That's the omega, that's, that's the 
let's see, let me find where I write, right. So this is, sorry, this is the lambda. So if we are, cons so for a cosmological constant, by definition, it means that, that the dark energy is constant in, throughout space and constant in time. Now, this is the standard model. And then we're going to think about uh, alternatives to it, which would include variations in that. Yeah? Um, the, uh, well, so let's, so, so now let me run through just about three slides on the, uh, the empirical basis of this standard model. And, and maybe that will answer your question. If not, ask it again. Um, so one uh, important part of the empirical basis is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, here we see the fluctuations uh, in temperature, uh, power spectrum of the fluctuations in temperature, of the fluctuations uh, in polarization, and the cross-correlation between uh, polarization and temperature. And there is a remarkably good uh, agreement with the red curve. Uh, and the red curve is the predictions of the standard cosmological model uh, where there are these six free parameters uh, that are adjusted to give a fit, um, but many more than, than six data points. So uh, this, is, um, uh, so this is a big uh, piece. Uh, this spectacular agreement with this high precision data um, is, uh, is a big piece. And I'll say a little bit, I'll say more in a few minutes uh, about what the different pieces of the, uh, of the CMB constrain. Um, a second uh, important pillar of the standard cosmological model is just direct measurements of the expansion history of the universe. Uh, and in particular, you know, cosmological constant really became part of the standard cosmological model because of measurements of uh, supernovae in the late 1990s. So using the luminosity of type 1a supernovae as a standard candle, uh, and thereby inferring the distances to things at high redshift, uh, and finding that the supernovae uh, were fainter than they would be even in a universe that was just uh, freely expanding. Uh, that was what implied that there had to be uh, acceleration. So in the first papers uh, from 97, 98, 99, uh, that was a kind of two sigma effect in a couple of different experiments. Uh, but today, that's, uh, there's pretty uh, spectacular versions of the, uh, of the supernova evidence. Uh, and so here, these are plots from, uh, from four different uh, surveys, principally the Sloan survey and the Supernova Legacy survey from CFHT with some high rates of supernovae from Hubble Space Telescope uh, and local calibrators. And the, uh, and the line going through this is, again, the prediction of the standard cosmological model, uh, treating these supernovae as constant candle, uh, standard candles to infer distance throughout. And if you vary, if, for instance, you go to an open universe, then you'll get uh, substantial departures from this uh, at the high end. And then we also have measurements of the expansion history from baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, so uh, measuring the clustering of galaxies uh, to pick out the feature that represents the same, uh, uh, the same physics that produces those fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, imprints this calculable uh, scale in the clustering of galaxies that's showing up here as this peak in the correlation function. I'll have quite a bit more to say about baryon acoustic oscillations uh, over uh, later today and in the, the upcoming lectures. Uh, but the main thing is that we're able to measure the location of this peak uh, with very high precision at several different redshifts. So that's an alternative to supernovae for measuring the expansion history of the universe uh, and gives a consistent result, uh, again, favoring a uh, lambda CDM model with the same, uh, with the same cosmological parameters. Uh, so that's, uh, those are expansion history measurements. Uh, and then more generally, uh, we have uh, measurements of the shape of the power spectrum. And uh, so really, we'd like to measure the shape of the matter power spectrum. Uh, but we can't really do that 
Uh, we're getting to the point where we can do that with weak gravitational lensing, but it's pretty, uh, pretty limited but, uh, at present. But we can uh, measure the shape of the power spectrum of galaxies uh, or of the power spectrum uh, of uh, the Lyman Alpha Forest. Uh, and so here are measurements of the power spectrum of galaxies, uh, again, compared to the lambda CDM prediction. Uh, and we see uh, these oscillations here are the same things that are showing up as this peak in the correlation function. Uh, and, the, um, uh, and the overall shape uh, is clearly also in good agreement with the, uh, with the theoretical predictions, although compared to the cosmic microwave background, you know, we don't have as much precision and we don't have uh, as much interesting structure. Nonetheless, we can measure the clustering of matter at a much lower redshift uh, and get a consistent answer. And then finally, there's the amplitude of matter clustering. Uh, how strongly uh, is dark matter clustered? And again, the challenge is that uh, we, don't, uh, we, we don't see the dark matter directly. Uh, so we have to use various techniques, weak gravitational lensing, clusters of galaxies, Redshift space distortions, that's what's being shown uh, in the lower right. This is uh, the clustering uh, correlation function of galaxies as a function of separation uh, perpendicular to the line of sight and along the line of sight. And this, uh, the fact that these contours are not spherical but they're squashed uh, is a sign of the peculiar velocities of galaxies. Uh, and by measuring their, the, that squashing, we can infer the characteristic peculiar velocities and ask how strongly the matter has to be clustered to produce that. Um, and at the sort of 10% level, that, uh, that agrees with the model predictions. So let me create some more space. So empirical basis, uh, say, is uh, CMB fluctuations expansion history from supernovae and from baryon acoustic oscillations, the shape of the matter power spectrum, from galaxies, galaxy clustering, and the Lyman Alpha Forest, which I haven't shown you here, but I'll have uh, more to say about uh, today and, uh, and tomorrow. And the amplitude of dark matter clustering so basically sigma 8 that's something that agrees at the 10% level uh, with the predictions I think I'll skip that slide but that's showing that sorry that slide is showing that you've got uh, you know, lots of, of constraints on different combinations of parameters, and uh, typically the, uh, this is from combinations of cosmic microwave background and baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, but the uh, standard model is always kind of near the center of those uh, error ellipses. Uh, but on this particular point of measuring the amplitude uh, of matter clustering, yeah. Good question. Okay, so on these, the um, the things that are going in are uh, cosmic microwave background, 
and uh, just the constraints on expansion history from baryon acoustic oscillations. And the bias of galaxies uh, affects the height of this peak, but it has, appears to have very little effect on the location of the peak. Uh, and the scale, uh, and it's that location, it's the physical scale that's being used, not the height. So I'll say more uh, probably on, uh, on Wednesday about uh, making that case that the galaxy bias doesn't really affect uh, the baryon acoustic oscillations. But, uh, but that is the reason that B isn't an additional parameter in here, is because the only thing for this particular set of plots that's being used is, the, um, is that BAO location. Good question. Um, so in terms of the, uh, this test about the amplitude of dark matter clustering, right, we're really taking the level of fluctuations observed in the cosmic bicori background which is proportional to AS e to the minus 2 tau. And then using either a linear theory, uh, and we'll come to this equation in a few minutes, but that's an equation for how fluctuations grow uh, in linear perturbation theory, or using uh, n-body simulations to, uh, to advance the structure from redshift of 1,000 to some low redshift uh, when we've got observations. And then we're using some kind of measurements of low redshift structure to, uh, to try to infer the clustering of the dark matter. And of course, the difficulty is that this is a map of the galaxies. So to infer the clustering of dark matter, uh, we need to use uh, things like uh, the abundance of galaxy clusters. or uh, redshift space distortions in galaxy clustering, uh, or weak gravitational lensing to try to measure uh, the dark matter clustering uh, directly. And I'll be saying more about, uh, about each of these. But those are basically uh, the techniques that people use to try to measure uh, sigma 8, the amplitude of fluctuations today. And you know things almost fit, but, uh, but they don't quite fit. So having, uh, I guess, I'll add to this uh, in terms of empirical basis that uh, the standard model gives a, a plausible setting for galaxy formation. And particularly, that's important to the cold dark matter part of it, uh, that when you try to uh, follow the formation of galaxies within this standard model, you get reasonable results. Uh, at least putting in somewhat reasonable assumptions about cooling of gas, formation of stars, uh, and influence of energy input from those stars, uh, so that uh, you can take this model and, and construct a reasonable theory uh, of galaxy formation that's in pretty good agreement with uh, observations of galaxies in the local universe and with the evolution of the galaxy population uh, out to high redshift. So the uh, caveats um, to, uh, to this empirical basis are, uh, first of all, the lowest, the lowest multiples in the cosmic microwave background. So let's go back. Uh, you can see in particular uh, that this quadrupole is surprisingly low. Um, and there's also some disagreements around here. And it's uh, you know, generally thought, I think, that, that these are probably statistical flukes. Uh, possibly 
statistical, uh, sorry, possibly systematic uh, effects in the, in the observations, although those are, are you know, better ruled out than, uh, than they used to be. Uh, but it's possible that somehow that uh, particularly this very low uh, fluctuation amplitude on the largest scales that we can measure is telling us something interesting uh, about the structure of the universe. So that's uh, one of the caveats that people worry about. A second uh, is um, that the Lyman Alpha Forest uh, BAO measurements don't quite fit. I'll have more to say about that uh, probably on, on Wednesday. Um, another is uh, direct distance ladder measurements of the Hubble constant. So when you really uh, go try to measure uh, H naught from, uh, from uh, distances to Cepheids to calibrate distances to supernovae uh, and then supernovae to calibrate distances to galaxies, uh, these tend to give um, 70 to 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec uh, versus the lambda CDM uh, expectation of uh, about uh, 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the um, and then the low redshift measurements of matter clustering are typically. 5 to 10 percent below uh, the prediction. So let's, uh, let me address one point that I forgot uh, here, which is uh, the Hubble constant itself. Uh, this H looks like it should be another parameter in the model. Uh, and the reason it's not is that the assumption of a flat universe, if we have uh, omega matter, or sorry, omega cold dark matter plus omega baryon uh, plus omega radiation plus omega lambda equal to one for a flat universe, that uh, determines the value of H. Uh, so if you know this and this and this, uh, then this and the radiation density we know from measuring the cosmic microwave background, adding those up and requiring they equal one determines the Hubble constant, so that's not a separate parameter. However, as soon as we allow departures from this model, if we allow curvature, uh, or if we allow extra energy components, then the Hubble constant is no longer a prediction. Uh, but in the standard case, it is. Yeah? Um, the, um, let me come back to that in a minute. It's a good question. So, you know, so, uh, Right, so there are various, various ways we could play with this in order to loosen that prediction. Um, and I don't want to jump to that. Uh, well, no, uh, okay, I'll, I'll address it now. So the... Um, 
so I think that, that uh, I actually forget how, I think it is difficult to resolve this with omega k uh, because that's sufficiently well constrained by the cosmic microwave background fluctuations alone that even when you open up that degree of freedom, I'm actually not certain of this, but I think uh, it remains difficult to get uh, the Hubble constant correct. However, you can go away from constant dark energy uh, or you can go away from, um, you can add extra neutrino species, so you change omega radiation uh, in ways that will, that will resolve this difference. Um, and in fact, I think it is most likely uh, that these measurements are wrong uh, rather than new physics, but possibly this indicates new physics. And I'll tell you more later about why I think uh, this is, uh, why I think it's most likely that this is uh, an observational problem. Um, but the, uh, nonetheless, this is certainly one of the, the discrepancies uh, that people worry about. Uh, and, you know, all of these uh, are, you know, about two sigma fluctuations in terms of, uh, two, two sigma deviations in terms of statistical significance. Uh, and so the, um, and in particular, uh, here where we talk about the low redshift measurements of galaxy clustering, I'll come to your question in just a minute. Um, this particular plot uh, from a paper uh, by the Boss collaboration, Oborg et al., uh, is comparing the predicted uh, combination, sigma 8 times omega matter to the 0.4, okay? And it turns out that most of these measurements, galaxy clusters, weak lensing, uh, redshift space distortions, they constrain a combination of the amplitude of matter fluctuations and the mean matter density because you can get a stronger weak lensing signal either by having more stronger fluctuations or by having more matter uh, that's there fluctuating. Uh, and this is roughly speaking, the combination that's, that's well constrained by the observations. Uh, and this is the prediction for the lambda CDM model. Um, and that's uh, taking the parameter constraints from, uh, from the Planck CMB measurements. These are actually the 2013 measurements, not the 2015 measurements, but they haven't changed much. Uh, so that corresponds to an omega matter that's a little bit bigger than 0.3 and a sigma 8 uh, that's about point, uh, point 0.81 or so, um, and uh, so that's what's predicted. And then the subsequent, uh, the black points as you go down here, show what happens if you allow uh, departures from, uh, de if you allow curvature, uh, if you allow dark energy not to be constant. Um, so we allow increasing degrees of complication, and there's more freedom in this prediction, uh, but the central value doesn't really change very much. Uh, except when you add uh, extra relativistic species, the predicted value actually goes up. Um, but uh, so this predicted value is fairly stable, although the more parameters you have in the model, uh, the larger the range of the predictions. And then the red points here are observational estimates, and the vertical position of the red points has no significance. They're just, uh, you know, it's not that this corresponds to that. They're just uh, sort of lined up. These two are from weak lensing. This is from cosmic shear by Hyman's et al. from the CFHT. This is galaxy galaxy lensing by Mandelbaum et al. in the Sloan survey. These three are different measurements of galaxy cluster uh, abundances using uh, X-ray or, uh, or weak lensing or sunyayev zeldovich data. And this is a more a recent uh, measurement of from galaxy clusters uh, using weak lensing mass calibration. And this one agrees. Uh, with the predictions, uh, but most of these are low. Uh, this is at redshift, you know, fairly low. These are measurements of uh, using the redshift space distortions, the motions of galaxies, uh, at redshift of about 0.6. Uh, and here the statistical significance of the discrepancy is low, particularly because these are all using the same data set. They're different analyses of the same data. Um, but they still come in uh, on the low side. This is a measurement from the Lyman Alpha Forest at rates of two and a half, and this one actually comes, uh, the, the measurement is above uh, the predicted amplitude. Um, so, uh, so this statement down here, the low rate of measurements are typically low, you know, basically comes to the fact that most of these red points are below the black points. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, something that 
may, uh, may simply go away with better observations um, or uh, you know, could be statistical flukes or could be systematic errors in the measurements. Uh, but there's, uh, I, would, I consider this one the most interesting uh, of the current tensions. OK, questions, yes? Um, uh, in this particular case, the, so this sigma 8 uh, is, is by definition uh, this, uh, the matter fluctuation amplitude in linear theory. However, in terms of predicting the observables, so for instance, uh, if you want to actually go from the observations of galaxy clusters to a constraint on sigma 8, then you need n-body simulations or, or something else. So I would say that, that I'm referring to a linear theory prediction, but there is nonlinear calculations going into actually deriving the empirical constraints. But that's one potential source of the uncertainty, and that'll be sort of, uh, we'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow. There was another uh, question here, yeah? Uh, yes, the H naught is is not very sensitive to the optical depth for reasons I'll I'll say in in a couple of minutes. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely insensitive, but it's not very sensitive to it. Um, yes. Right, so, the, um, so when uh, none of these are using just the amplitude of galaxy clustering to use uh, to compute the dark matter clustering. However, uh, so the only one that's actually using galaxy clustering in the middle panel are the measurements of, this, uh, of these redshift space distortions. And, the, uh, and so uh, the thing that you can get out from those measurements, you can basically get out this combination of the amplitude of fluctuations times the growth rate of fluctuations uh, independent of the galaxy bias. Um, but, the, uh, but yes, we can't simply measure this clustering uh, and infer this because uh, we would need some separate constraint on the galaxy bias. OK, uh, let me go on and the answers to, to some of these uh, may become more evident. Um, and I guess the last of these uh, caveats, uh, let's see, actually I don't want to erase that yet. Um, so let me go to here, um, would be that uh, there are uh, longstanding challenges uh, in the inner sort of kiloparsec scale regions of galaxies that the shapes of galaxy rotation curves uh, do not agree with the predictions of uh, the structure of dark matter halos, um, and, the, uh, and also the number of observed satellites of the Milky Way and other galaxies uh, is small compared to the number of dark matter substructures uh, that are pr predicted to be around, uh, uh, predicted to be in the halos uh, of galaxies like the Milky Way. Um, so uh, this is sometimes, uh, the first of those is sometimes referred to as the cusp problem or the cusp core problem. Uh, the second one is the missing satellites problem. Um, the too big to fail problem is kind of a combination of those two things. Um, I actually, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, uh, uh, I know quite a lot about that subject and I'm happy to, to uh, answer questions about it. Um, but I'm not going to focus on it uh, for these lectures. Um, I will say my view is that most likely the resolutions to these things 
uh, lie in the baryonic physics uh, and the influence of, uh, of the baryons on the dark matter um, and the ability of uh, low mass halos to actually condense their baryons uh, and make galaxies. Uh, but it's possible that those things are telling us something interesting about the properties uh, of the dark matter, uh, and that remains an, uh, that remains an, an open question. Yeah. So this is a pretty small scale so far. Yep. So uh, simulations in what is their resolution? In like what are the smallest? Scale? Right. So the uh, I would say. There are simulations of galaxy formation that get down to uh, resolution of uh, scales of tens of parsecs, even. Um, and the, uh, so I think that, that uh, it's certainly been a long-standing, and one of the early questions was whether these discrepancies reflected numerical errors. Uh, and I think, that's, I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't reflect errors in the numerical predictions. Uh, but they are sensitive to the assumptions about the underlying physics, about the feedback from star formation, uh, and that's where most of the debate about, those things, about these things uh, lies at the moment. Yeah? So it's different assumptions for each red point. Um, the, uh, so uh, because that goes into how you went from the observational data to a constraint on these uh, parameters. So I will, let me not go into that now, but for each of these, I'll have somewhat more to say uh, about each of them, uh, or at least about several of them over, uh, particularly in tomorrow's lecture. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, to decentralize problems, uh, basically, dark energy survey is important to be found many small satellites that you So I think that, that the um, uh, relative to when this was the missing satellites were first highlighted as a problem, uh, on the one hand, we've discovered many more satellites, first with the Sloan survey and then with the, the dark energy survey. Um, but that, it, it, it turns out it's not enough to sort of resolve what uh, the, all of those satellites are, are pushing fainter and therefore getting to lower halo masses, which are still more numerous. So actually, uh, it, I, I would say in, in simple form, it's even though we found a lot more, uh, more dwarf galaxies by searching only small areas of the sky, uh, in itself, that, that hasn't resolved the, the issue. It's a good question. OK. Um, So we can now say more about alternatives that we might consider. How might we vary this standard model? I'll just leave that up there, but. Uh, so there are a number of, of, uh, of these underlying assumptions here uh, that we can vary. And, the, um, and you know, there are lots of, of very, uh, very natural things or very crazy things uh, that we could think about, uh, but which aren't interesting because they're just ruled out. So certainly, uh, you know, you would, uh, a natural thing to consider would be something where the dark matter is only baryons, but all those models fail drastically. Um, and there are, uh, uh, so when I make my list of alternatives to lambda CDM, uh, I'm gonna only consider models that uh, at least uh, can come roughly uh, as close to existing observations. Uh, as the standard model, uh, because lots of physical interesting alternatives are just uh, empirically ruled out. So uh, one thing is uh, non-zero neutrino mass. Uh, 
And this is, uh, is really something that's uh, guaranteed uh, because we know from oscillation experiments that neutrinos have a non-zero mass. Uh, and actually, we know that that minimum value uh, of the sum of the neutrino masses, uh, sum over the three species, uh, is about 0.06 electron volts. And at this level, uh, that already is enough to change uh, the growth of structure uh, enough that it should eventually be detectable. So current constraints from cosmology are at the level of something like 0.2 electron volts. Uh, and as we uh, further improve precision, we expect uh, to eventually get to the point where even at the minimum neutrino mass, uh, we ought to be able to measure it. So that, I would say, it's not really, that's not violating any fundamental assumption, uh, but it is introducing uh, a new free parameter uh, to the model, which is you know, omega nu h squared, the energy density of neutrinos. And the, uh, then there is a tensor a contribution to cosmic microwave background fluctuations. So gravity waves. Um, and this is considered at least a perfectly natural uh, extension of the model. Many inflation uh, physics models uh, predict that there should be tensor uh, contributions. So I wouldn't say this one's guaranteed, but this one is uh, plausible. And here your new parameters are uh, usually written uh, R, the ratio of tensor fluctuations to scalar fluctuations. And NT, uh, which is the spectral index of those uh, in tensor fluctuations uh, analogous to uh, the NS for the scalar fluctuations. Uh, and then we get to things that are not guaranteed, uh, but could be there. So uh, dynamical dark energy. meaning uh, that the equation of state of dark energy, so a cosmological constant corresponds to an equation of state, uh, pressure over rho c squared, um, equal to minus 1. And if w is not minus 1, then the energy density uh, of dark energy evolves over time, uh, and w itself can be uh, can be a function of time. And the, um, we can have uh, extra relativistic species. Uh, which would be uh, the number of neutrinos uh, you would think it means the number of neutrinos not equal to three, uh, but in fact, the way these calculations are done, uh, usually three refers to three species of neutrinos that decouple entirely before electron-positron annihilation. And because of uh, the injection of energy from electron-positron annihilation, it turns out that the standard three neutrino species, in the way these things are usually uh, parameterized, corresponds to n nu of 3.046. So if there's an extra neutrino species or any other form of, of uh, energy density, then that's, uh, uh, that can, uh, that's an alteration of the standard model. Um, uh, there can be uh, curvature or features in the primordial power spectrum.
So instead of this being a power law, uh, it might be uh, might uh, curve, uh, or it might have uh, jumps. And uh, so that's often referred to uh, by uh, in terms of running uh, of the spectral index. That would mean this NS is changing as a function of scale. There's uh, non-Gaussianity. Uh, and so uh, some models of inflation predict departures from, uh, from Gaussian uh, fluctuations. So you'll hear more about that uh, from Matthias Aldoyaga and probably from, uh, from Justin Corey. And now I need more space. So I'll erase here. So a non-flat universe. Omega k not equal to 0. Um, and that would have uh, important implications for the sort of global structure uh, of the universe, uh, because the, the basic uh, geometry uh, is different if we have curvature. And even an omega curvature of 10 to the minus 3 or something would be quite hard to understand in typical inflation models uh, and would give us uh, something, some interesting clue uh, to what's going on. And uh, departures from GR. So modified gravity as an explanation for, uh, for cosmic acceleration. Dark matter, uh, there are various ways in which dark matter properties could be different. So we could have dark matter that is self-interacting uh, or has uh, some low thermal velocities. That would affect these issues uh, about uh, the uh, challenges on subgalactic scales. Uh, or if dark matter decays over the history of the universe, that would affect the history of energy density uh, and alter some of these other things. Um, so yes, other variations of dark matter properties. And uh, other variations of the primordial fluctuations. So in particular, Uh, if we have not adiabatic fluctuations, uh, but isocurvature fluctuations, so by fooling with the early universe physics, uh, we can get fluctuations that are not present equally in all the different energy density species, uh, and those produce distinctive signatures uh, in the cosmic microwave background. So all of these are things uh, which we could uh, imagine changing about the, the standard cosmological model. Each one of them brings in some new free parameters. Um, and all of them are fairly tightly constrained. We actually uh, have already, from existing observations, pretty good constraints on any of these, uh, on the parameters of any of these alternatives. But this is where a lot of the action is uh, in precision cosmology today, uh, is trying to uh, look for any of these departures uh, or constrain those parameter variations. Okay, questions? Yeah. So I think that the tensor contribution is mostly, uh, you know, that's really mostly in the, in the rain, realm of, of cosmic microwave background. So uh, you, get, you might get some, in, I would say there the role of large scale structure is that it helps you constrain some of the other parameters of the cosmological model. And therefore, you can better use your cosmic microwave background anisotropies to focus on tensor contributions. So for instance, you know, the constraints on tensor contributions from the CMB are much stronger if you include baryon acoustic oscillation measurements of the expansion history. 
but it's probably there's not really a direct signature that we're looking at in large scale structure. It's more in the CMB. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's I think a reasonable. Good. So I think. Uh, let me write down what I think you're talking about, and then if there's, uh, and then you could uh, add more if I missed it. Uh, but yeah, something I didn't put on here would be some uh, coupling between uh, dark energy and dark matter, and that could take many different forms. Uh, you know, one of basically one of these species decaying and producing the other, uh, or uh, or direct uh, interactions by which one uh, affects the other. So, in the standard model, these are just two entirely different things. Um, but we could have uh, interactions of the dark matter with itself, interactions of the dark matter with the baryons, or uh, between uh, the uh, the dark energy and the dark matter. So, yes, this is also uh, a big. Uh, focus of uh, of some current work. Is that, is that what you were after? Okay. Um, all right. I have uh, I've got quite a lot. Uh, on one hand, the the I've got quite a lot more in my notes that I'm going to get through in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the last of these topics about forecasting experimental performance uh, kind of naturally uh, slides into the last lecture, so I'll probably put that uh, at the beginning of Wednesday. Um, but the, the intermediate stuff is about uh, the different probes we have of uh, of these kinds, uh, the, the different observational probes that we have and what their information content is. Um, and uh, so what I think I will do is I'll try to cover uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background uh, specifically and then uh, baryon acoustic oscillations and weak lensing and the Lyman alpha forest uh, I will basically uh, cover in, uh, in tomorrow's lecture um, and, uh, and some of the other things I'll either skip uh, or go through, go through faster um, somewhere along the way. Uh, so I, and I apologize, I wasn't able to post all my notes long enough in advance for you to like print them out and bring them with you. Uh, but there is quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a lot more uh, words in the notes than I attempt to write uh, on the blackboard. Um, and I will get the, the notes for tomorrow's lecture up sometime, uh, sometime this afternoon. So that, uh, so that you can look for those. Um, so with that, let's go specifically uh, to the cosmic microwave background. And uh, you know, there are other people lecturing in this school who are more expert on this subject than me. Um, however, uh, no one seemed to have uh, you're going to hear about the uh, search for B modes in the cosmic microwave background uh, as a probe of gravity waves, particularly from Bruce Partridge. Um, but just in terms of what we generically learn from the cosmic microwave background, um, that didn't, uh, it, it may be familiar to many of you, most of you, uh, but it's pretty basic to, uh, to everything that, that comes further. So I wanted to. Uh, to make sure we covered uh, the basic ground. So what's great about the cosmic microwave background um, is that uh, the observations are hard but not impossible. Uh, and so over, uh, over decades of effort, uh, people have gotten to the point where we pretty much measure it uh, free of observational systematics. Uh, the observational systematics are under control uh, over most scales. There are some challenges when you get to polarization and small scales. Uh, but mostly that works. Um, and the physics is straightforward because the fluctuations are small uh, and they can be calculated uh, in linear perturbation theory. And that fluctuation spectrum is very complicated. It's got a lot going into it, so it's responding to many different physical effects. 
So it actually has influence, uh, has signatures of all these different parameters of the standard model. Um, but the, you know, the summary of what we get from it, uh, at least my version of it would be, that the heights of the peaks uh, constrain the dark matter density and the baryon density. So this you're seeing in the top two plot, uh, no, sorry, the bottom two plots. Um, and the, uh, you know, a great way to see this is if you go to Max Tegmark's CMB Movies uh, website. He's got, uh, so just Google Max Tegmark CMB Movies and you can uh, change uh, any one of these parameters and it will run through things and show you how the predicted CMB spectrum changes. Uh, but particularly, you can see that as you change uh, the matter density or the baryon density, uh, what mostly changes is the heights of these peaks and their relative heights. So both of these things influence the heights of the peaks, but not in the same way. Uh, and so kind of largely independent of other stuff, uh, the relative heights of the peaks give you uh, the matter density and the baryon density. Um, and from that, you can compute uh, the sound horizon, which is the integral from uh, zero to T star, the time of recombination, of the sound speed divided by the expansion factor. Um, and this sound speed uh, is C over the square root of three uh, times one plus three rho baryon over four uh, rho photon to the minus a half. So this is the speed at which sound waves propagate through the photon baryon fluid. Uh, before recombination, the photons are coupled to the electrons, the electrons are coupled to the protons. Uh, and at early times, these sound waves propagate just at the speed of light over the square root of three. And then as baryons become important, uh, then that uh, also affects the, uh, the growth of this sound horizon. This plays an important role in baryon acoustic oscillation measurements, but it's also the physical scale that you're seeing in those fluctuations. And so once you can measure omega b h squared, you know this, we can calculate that from basic physics, uh, and so, uh, so we can calculate this sound horizon. And then the, um, the angular uh, scale of peaks determines uh, Rs over the angular diameter distance to the redshift of recombination. Uh, and that is particularly sensitive to uh, curvature. And that you see in the upper left that as you change uh, the curvature of the universe uh, away from omega total equal one would be a flat universe. As you go to uh, an open universe, those peaks shift to steadily smaller angular scales because you've got the same sound horizon, uh, but this angular diameter distance increases. And then there are other things that affect this angular diameter distance. There's the Hubble constant. There's uh, the uh, dark energy equation of state uh, and other things. Uh, and so uh, you can also see that dark energy um, produces uh, small shifts in the angular location of the peaks in the upper right. Uh, so there's some constraint on omega lambda. Uh, and on W, uh, the equation of state of dark energy. And, you know, it's less sensitive to that, but the measurements are very high precision. The uh, overall shape uh, constrains uh, NS. Right. So if we go from, that's not shown here anymore. 
uh, but as you just compare what's happening at large scales to small scales, uh, that's constraining this overall tilt of the spectrum, uh, as well as uh, other uh, departures from scale invariance, like curvature uh, or steps. The amplitude, just the overall heights of these curves, constrains the actual amplitude of matter fluctuations, AS, times this e to the minus 2 tau. Um, the polarization uh, on large scales is what constrains tau itself. So we use that polarization signal to figure out how much late time rescattering is there's been, because that, uh, that scattering induces polarization. Uh, so then once you can constrain that, you can uh, back AS out. Um, but uncertainties in that are a big source of the, uh, still a big source of the remaining uncertainty in AS. Um, this uh, tail uh, down to small scales, uh, the so-called damping tail, where the fluctuations are damped, um, constrains uh, the detailed history of recombination. And so anything you do that screws around with recombination by, for instance, changing physics of atoms at redshift of 1,000 compared to today, or by introducing extra energy species or something will affect that damping tail uh, and, uh, and often be ruled out by that overall shape to small scales. Um, I'm almost done. Low multiples. constrain tensor to scalar. Okay. And the reason for that is that the tensor fluctuations contribute on large scales, but they're redshifted away on small scales. So that uh, overall amplitude on the largest scales compared to smaller scales uh, is a signature of the contribution of gravity waves. Uh, something that's just recently become powerful uh, is that uh, lensing of the CMB constrains uh, matter clustering. And so there's a distinctive signature in the cosmic microwave background maps that you can look at to measure how much the microwave background fluctuations have been lensed on the way to us. Uh, and that's most sensitive uh, to uh, the redshift range of about 2 to 4. That's where, maybe I should say 1 to 4. So it's the matter clustering in that redshift range that produces most of the detectable CMB lensing. Uh, and you could also now look for CMB lensing behind clusters uh, and other things. Uh, but for the first time, we're actually getting a measurement of low redshift matter clustering uh, from the cosmic microwave background. Um, high multiples, so high L, small angular scales, uh, is uh, sensitive to uh, the sunyaev zeldovich effect from, high, uh, from hot electrons uh, in collapsed structures. Um, uh, and this, in turn, depends on uh, low ridge of matter clustering. Sorry, say again? Yeah, uh, I'll say here uh, L uh, less than 40. But the lower L you go, the more sensitive you are. 
and high L, uh, I would say, uh, greater than 2,000. So at L greater than 2,000, the primary anisotropies are basically gone, and what you're left with is the Sinai's Um I think uh, the answer here is, is basically L. Uh, it seems to me, in principle, it should be something like L less than uh, 100. Um, because at that point you're looking at scales that are larger than the, micro, than the uh, horizon at reionization. But mostly people at least seem to focus on L less than 10 uh, for this. Um, and then uh, the last thing is that the large uh, angle, and here again I think this is sort of L less than uh, 100, but uh, you'll get better answers on this from, uh, from Bruce Partridge. Uh, B mode polarization, sorry, uh, B mode uh, polarization is a direct measure uh, of the gravity wave contribution and thus tensor to scalar. So there's all of these different, uh, I mean, I think the things to take away from this list are, one is that you know, there's a lot of different pieces of information and hence lots of, uh, of different, uh, you're able to constrain many different pieces. Uh, but the second is that, that that information, it's at least somewhat separable. I mean, at some level, you put in all of these things and you make a prediction for that whole curve. Uh, but really what's telling you about the matter density and telling you about the angular distance to last scattering, telling you about NS, they're different pieces of these observations. Uh, and that's why uh, you know, we're sometimes able to get good constraints on one thing, uh, even if we can't get good constraints on another. Um, let me take one or two final questions and then we'll break for coffee. Yeah. Yeah, so, so on, large, uh, on large angular scales, uh, the integrated sachs wolf effect uh, influences the fluctuations, and particularly what you're seeing here, uh, this big boost out here and this boost here, are both due to uh, the changes in the gravitational potential because of what's called the integrated sachs wolf effect. Um, so one can break that out as a separate thing, uh, affecting the, the large scale, uh, the lowest multiples. And... And I think the unfortunate thing about the integrated sachs wolf effect is that uh, because it's confined to these uh, largest scales where, uh, where you just can't get very high precision because there's only one universe to look at, um, it's actually, at this point, it's quite difficult to come up with any model that, uh, that can fail uh, measurements of the, of the ISW effect. Um, but it's still giving you some information uh, about dark energy. And I'd say in addition to looking at the CMB alone, and maybe this is what you're getting at, you can try to isolate the ISW contribution by looking for correlations with, cross-correlations with galaxy maps, for instance. Okay, last question. Yeah. The lensing? Okay, good question. So, um, the, uh, so one way of distinguishing the lensing is through, uh, is through polarization, and particularly lensing will produce B-mode polarization on small scales, uh, which you don't get from the primary fluctuations. But the, uh, I think the uh, one way to think about the lensing signal is uh, you've, you've got some patch of the, of the microwave background, and, in, uh, and if you have an overdensity of matter uh, in front of it, then you'll sort of, uh, you'll squeeze that patch, you'll focus that patch, make it smaller in size. If you've got an underdense region, you'll stretch it. Um, and so really, that's sort of taking this power spectrum, uh, and it's shifting its angular scale up or down, up or down in different patches on the sky. And so uh, the thing that isolates the CMB lensing signal is actually not the power spectrum, uh, but a four-point uh, clustering measure. But as I, uh, my 
the thing that makes the most intuitive sense to me is that you can think of this uh, four-point signal as being, you're really asking how much does the CMB power spectrum fluctuate from one region of the sky to another. So you've got variance of the power spectrum that's being produced by convergence and divergence. And you know, a variance of a variance is a, a four-point measure. Um, I am happy to ask, answer more questions uh, during the break, during the lunch breaks, et cetera. Um, but let's, uh, uh, let's take our, our coffee break. And I think we restart at 1130. Is that right? Thank you.